You know, when we talk about the authority of Christ, what it comes down to is basically nobody, not even your parents, not even your grandparents, love you like God does. And he's got a plan for your life. And I will also even go on record as saying this. I know that your parents, especially for those who are not in college or still in high school and uh, maybe even junior high school, that the primary thing that your parents would love to see happen, they can't make it happen, but they'd love to see happen is when you start your own decision to follow Jesus Christ on your own. Is there a parent in here that does not want that? That's the signal to them. I know it was a signal for me that I can release you now. I know that they say 18 years old is supposed to be an adult and, you know, but a lot of times people are not ready. And um, they're just not ready. So age doesn't make the difference. But certainly if you are living your life according to the way the Bible says to live it, then at least morally and ethically, I know you're on the right trail. I want to start off this evening by showing you a film. Anybody here ever saw the movie Most? It's an, an old movie, M-O-S-T. Anybody? Got one person saw it. Two people saw it. There was a scene in the movie that represents clearly God's love for us. And I want to share that, share that with you. And then lead us into our subject matter for uh, tonight. The primary purpose of me showing this for you is that God has already done everything that he can do. When Jesus Christ died for you, he's done everything. That's why he said it is finished. My work is done. Holy Spirit can guide you and direct you. But where Jesus is concerned, he's got you right to the point. Well, you're ready to take your next step. In the movie, this man, his wife, I believe, has died. And he's raising his son. And he's on his first day of work as a uh, conductor of one of these bridges that goes up and down when the boats uh, go through. And so that's sort of the setup. We probably want to kill the lights on that. Přijdu a půjdeme nahoru a budeme pouštět čupátka, jo? Položíme most, no, mostem položíme most. 30 minut sedět, nikam neběhat. Jasný? Tak jo. Tak čau.
Raja. Raja. Raja!
things in this book that will help us to live life better. It'll even teach you how to do finances. It'll even teach you how to have a, a good relationship. It'll teach you how to choose your friends. But the central message of the Bible is God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believes in him shall never die. All lives matter. All lives matter. The father in the film represented who? God the father. The little boy that got killed, he, he was just trying to help us. That Who did he represent? Yeah. Who were the people on the train? Yeah. And you know the thing about it? is that if somebody never tells the people on the train what happened on that day, that you now have an opportunity to live, to not just live a better life, but to live eternally. Things will just go on. They'll continue to still shoot dope. They'll continue to do what they want to do. I am uh, talking tonight about the hands. Jesus has done, God has done everything that he can do. There's, there's nothing more that he can do, and there's nothing more that you need than what he's already provided for us. We talked the first time about God having authority over your head, over your thinking. How do you do that? You get his word into your head. We talked about this morning, allowing God to have authority over your heart. Not this heart, but what is the most valued relationship to you? Tonight we want to talk about authority over your hands. In other words, what you do. God has done everything that he can do, and now it's up to me. Look at the person up next to you and tell him, it's up to me now. Yeah, it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter which school you go to. It, it doesn't matter what your major is. If we are really following Jesus Christ and he has authority over our life, it comes down to this message. What are you going to do? What are you going to do? We talked about the head. We talked about the heart. And now we're talking about the hands. This is Peter's speech to the Sanhedrin and the people who were in the temple on the day that the uh, Holy Spirit came upon the people. And it says that they heard the message, they were cut to the heart, and now they say, what are we going to do? There were 3,000 people that got saved on this day. 3,000 people. I don't know how God will use you, but I know that he'll use you. All right. What do we mean when we say the hands? Let's read it together. The hands is what you do in your service for God to help others line up with his will. In other words, it's the mission of the church. That's, that's our purpose. It is the mission. It is what I'm supposed to be doing. There are many titles in the church. There's pastors and elders and uh, uh, a choir and, and worship leaders and so forth. We all have the same job. Everybody has the same job. The mission is the very same thing for everybody. And that's to help people to get lined up with God's will for their life. Let's read this. The mission of a godly person is is focused on being correctly aligned with God so they can bring others into that same blessed relationship. They understand that their performance must reflect a balanced spiritual life. What that means is this, is that my ministry is helping people to align with Christ. And so one of the ways, it's not just telling, but one of the ways or several of the ways that I help this to happen is number one, his presence 
to get them involved in worship, to get them involved in prayer. Prayer is so important. I cannot, I cannot uh, express how important prayer is to you and really get it across. But your prayer life is essential for understanding his presence in your life. His word, Bible study and discipleship, his gifts, fellowship and stewardship, his work, service and evangelism. It might look like this. There are nine essentials that we just did there. And there are nine responses to Christ. If I'm going to do something, I am going to hear from God, which is revelation. We talked about this earlier this afternoon. For those that weren't here, there's two kinds of special revelation. What are they? Okay. And what is the specific revelation? That's the one we want. The living word, which is who? Jesus Christ and the written word, which is the Bible. So we get revelation from God and he demands a response from us. He demands that we do something. We don't just listen to it, but we are called to do something with it. So then looking back at those nine things, God reveals his word. We respond with Bible study. And discipleship, we get deeper into the word, we get deeper into an understanding of what he says. God reveals his work. What are we supposed to be doing? We respond with missions and evangelism. That means to go and to share the love of God with other people. We, he reveals his gifts and we respond with stewardship, fellowship and service. You're at the point now as young people where hopefully you understand the importance of investing in the work of God, which means that at your church, when it comes time to the offering, when it comes time to a tithing or uh, however you, you give, you should be giving something. Now, I know for a lot of young people today, the thought is, well, they'll put $300. Well, I didn't put $300 into my sneakers because these are Converse's. You can buy these for $25. But some of you wear Nike and, and some of these others, and those, those shoes cost you about $200, $300. And folk don't have any problem investing in Nike. And I'm not saying that's a bad investment. They probably last longer than Converse's. But let me tell you, there is no better investment than in the work of God. How many of you women in here, I'm talking about young ladies, one day you're going to get married, right? Going to marry one of these young men, maybe, if they're lucky. Amen. Yeah, if they're lucky. My brother over here, he lucked out. And um, how many of you women would stay with a man who didn't invest in the family? And what I mean by that is, you know, one of the things that women do that men can't do, and that is have babies. And so there ought to be some extra perks. Can I get a witness, men? That's right. There ought to be some extra perks for the women, and especially those who stay home and take care of the family, take care of those little babies. And we ought to invest in them. We ought to make sure that we give to that. Nobody would doubt that. And if you were married to somebody who was cheap and chinsy, one time I remember I, I mentioned that about uh, at a church I was with, Who, who's married to a cheap husband? And the pastor's wife stood up on top of the pew. She said, there he is right there. He's cheap. You know, I would hate for my wife to say that about me because if somebody ought to say that you invest in them, because when you love something, you give to it. Well, if you love God, if you love Jesus Christ, if you love the church, then you'll give to it. Nobody will have to force you. Nobody will have to push you. It's a part. It's what we do. If you ask them, brother, it, what we do is we take care of our families. Can I get a witness? That's what that's what we do. I'm not saying that women don't do that, but men are supposed to be leaders of the home. We take care of our families. Well, as followers of Jesus Christ, we take care of the church. And if we do anything less than that, then we're not living up. To the leadership that God has called us to. So he reveals his gifts, stewardship, fellowship, and service. He reveals his presence, and we respond in worship and in prayer. Let me tell you what a good picture of what worship looks like. You know, a lot of times we confuse what we do in here as worship, and I think that this is a type of worship, but it is not the clearest picture of worship. 
the clearest picture of worship is this. I have a will and God has a will. This is God's will. This is my will. When my will goes against God's will, then I bow. Are you with me? That doesn't, I don't have to be in here. I could be out there. I can be in my school. I can be in my job. I can be in my community. When my will goes contrary to the will of God, I don't expect God to bow for me. I bow to God. Am I making sense to you? That's a 24-7 job. And really, to be honest with you, there's only one type of sin. Sin is when you refuse to accept Jesus Christ as Lord. That's what sin is. When you lie and you steal and so forth, really, that's a symptom of a life that does not stay in that order where God, through Jesus Christ, is the authority and I am the subjugate. So if I am ever going to grow in grace, if I ever if I am going to grow as a follower of Jesus Christ, as his disciple, then I've got to learn to bow when my will is different than his. Now, a big problem is, is that oftentimes we don't know what his will is because we don't have his word. So we have to work on that. So the presupposition, Jesus will not teach head us more of his word than we're willing to do. The Bible makes it clear that God wants us to be doers of the word. Obedience to God, doing what the scripture says to do. I want to uh, share uh, two scriptures with you very quick. I'll just tell you about them. Most of you are familiar with them. Matthew 7, 24 and 29. It's the last part of the Sermon on the Mount and of that which is called the Sermon on the Mount. And where he talks about, he gives his story as a benediction about the two builders. And both builders are good people. The difference between the builders is that one just listens and the other one listens and does what the word of God says. Some things happen in both their lives. As a matter of fact, the very same circumstance. It says that the rain came down and the waters rose and the wind beat against their house. That means their life. And the one who did what the word of God said to do, his house remained standing. The one who just listened, his house fell over. All right, what is the big difference and what is the illustration there? The rain came down. That's, that's referring to circumstances of life. You ask any adult in here and they'll tell you circumstances will come. Am I right about that, adults? The things happen. Things happen in your marriage. Things happen in your job. Things happen in your finances. You get beat up from the top. You get beat up from the bottom, and sometimes it seems like you get beat up all the way around. And what God's word says, and we can teach this principle. Remember, we talked about principles earlier. That principles then can be used now today. That if your house is built on doing what the word of God says, you'll have a stronger house. He uses another illustration of sand and rock. As a matter, in that story, he says that the one who listens and does what the word of God says is like the one who built his house on rock. The one who built his house uh, didn't do anything, but just listened to the word is like the one who built his house on sand. What's the difference between sand and rock? The, the difference is nothing. Rock is just sand together. And sand is just rock loose. But when you have rock that is together, it can be quite a force. It can be a weapon. Sand is not, doesn't have the same characteristics. It's, it's because it, it's loose. If you were going to build a house, what would you put down first? Sand or would you put down rock? And you, what is that called? It's called a foundation. Notice something about the foundation. The foundation, let's say if it's a rectangle, you can't build, you can't build your house off of that rock. Because if you do, the house will tip over. So the rock determines how my life will be built. 
Jesus is the rock. As a matter of fact, that's another name for him. He's the big rock. Sometimes people mistake Peter because his name means rock too. But Peter, Petros, means little rock. Jesus is Petra, which means the big rock. He is the cornerstone of which all of the other stones are built around. We plug into him. James says basically the same thing here, that we must be doers of the word if, in fact, we are going to have a strong house. No one has learned anything until behavior has been changed. When you start doing what the word says, you go to medical school, you start doing what the medical words say, then you become a doctor. You start, go, you go to law school, you learn what the words say, you start doing what the word says, then you become a lawyer. You start doing, you learn what the word of God says, and you start doing it, then you become the image of God. This was a little exercise I was going to give you, but it'd take too long for you to do it. But I want you to do this really quickly. I want you to think of one person in the Old Testament and one person in the New Testament. I want you to yell it out that did what God said to do. And just write it down somewhere. One person in the Old Testament and one person in the New Testament that did what God said to do. And I want to see if I have the people up here that uh, you have. I'll just give you a minute there. One person in the Old Testament who did what God said do. They were a doer of the word. And then in the New Testament, one person. And I'm sure that you probably could think of a lot of people that could fit this, uh, this paradigm, this characteristic. Okay, you should have it by now. Okay, some of you look like you're still searching in your mind. Okay, all right. In the Old Testament, these are some of the people that I come up with who were doers of the word of God. Noah. Yeah, Noah. They thought Noah was crazy. Go build an ark. There's even, not even any water here yet. But you know what? God said what? Build that ark. Abraham. Moses. Joshua. Deborah. Elijah. Abigail. Nehemiah. Rehab. Rehab Daniel. And then in the New Testament... You may have somebody I don't have up here. Zechariah, Elizabeth, John the Baptist, Mary, Joseph, the disciples, Mary Magdalene, Paul, Barnabas, and Timothy. Now, who's got somebody I don't have up there? <laughs> well, <laughs> you know what? I tell you what. Can anybody, let's take it a step further. You're right. Jesus always did what the Father said do. Can anybody give me a verse where Jesus says that? That Now listen, Jesus, is Jesus God? All right, Jesus is God, but G, God shows himself in three different forms. We call it the Trinity. What are the forms? The Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. Sort of like I have two forms. I'm a professor and I'm a pastor. In the church where I served, nobody ever called me doctor or professor Ganey. They always called me Pastor Ganey. But in my school, in my graduate school, nobody ever called me pastor. They called me professor or Dr. Ganey. So I'm Ganey in two persons, but God is in three persons, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Can somebody give me one verse? Where Jesus says, I bow to the authority of the Father. Does anybody have one? Huh? Excuse me? Mark 1436. Can you read it? Or uh, uh, recite it? <laughs> oh, well, I read it. Okay. Okay. Abba Father, all things are possible for you. Remove this cup from me. Yet, not what I will, but what you will. But what you will, that's a good one. Anybody else? Let me get you to turn to, here's a good one to remember this by. I want you to go to John 12, 49 and 50. And I want somebody who's got a big voice to read it out. It especially, I'd like for you to read this one from the NIV translation. You got it? You want to read it out good and loud? Can you, can you read it out good and loud? Oh, you got to read it out good and loud. 
Okay, I, I want the NIV translation. Okay, I, I got to have somebody with a nice big voice in here. Somebody? Oh, all right, go ahead. That's a good big voice right there. Go ahead. For I did not speak on my own. Whoa! For I did not, what? Speak on my own. But what? But the Father who sent me commanded me. But the Father who sent me commanded me. Go ahead. Say all that I have spoken. Yeah. The Father who sent me commanded me what to say and how to say it. His words are the words that lead to eternal life. Yeah. So Jesus would definitely be obedient uh, there. And he was there at the beginning and he was there at the end. One thing they all had in common, going back to all those other people that were up there, and that is they are called to God to do something. If you are a follower of Jesus Christ, you are not called to do nothing. You are not following Jesus just to, as you may say, go to church. But you are called to do something. You know, one of the biggest things that worried me for a big, long time, I don't know in your culture, do you ever hear people say, I've been called to preach? You ever hear that? You ever, you've heard that before? I don't find that in the Bible. The closest I come to that is Paul says that God called me to go to Macedonia to preach to those people there, but I don't hear anything about God calling us to a gift. In other words, there's some people who are better preachers than others. There are a lot of people who are better teachers than me. It's not about me being better than someone else. It's not about me comparing myself to anyone else. I am called, come on, say it with me. I am called to God and it is God who gifts me. It is God. Matter of fact, when I was born again, I didn't even realize it, but God put the gifts he was going to give me in me. And you know what? I'm still discovering that there are things that God put in me that I didn't even know. I never wanted to be a preacher. I didn't know I, I could preach. God put that in me. And he knew at the right time he was going to mature it. I didn't know I was going to be a teacher. I didn't know I was going to be a counselor. I didn't know I was going to be a leader. You know, oftentimes you hear people say that God gives everybody one gift. Well, he does give you uh, one gift, but sometimes he'll give you ten gifts. It depends on how faithful you are with the little bit that he's given you. Sometime our attitude is this. Well, I can't sing like him or her, and, or I can't teach like him, so I'm not, or I can't preach like her, and I can't do like him. You're not, you're not in competition with each other. We are called to God. Look at somebody and say, we're called to God. <laughs> yeah, we're all called to God. And God gifts us. He puts the gifts in us. And God doesn't play gender issues either. I know some women who can out-preach me, out-teach me. I don't know where your culture is on that in your particular church. I'm just simply saying that my job is to train all people to use their gifts for God. I don't have a ministry or a job to give you, but I believe that God does. And so you just make yourself available, and I promise you something. God will use you. I'm going to look real quickly here with you at 1 Corinthians. You don't have to turn there, but Paul's letter to the Corinthians, the first chapter, the first to the 10th verse. What does it mean to be called? First of all, again, say with me, I am called. I am called to do something. I am called to do something. I am not called to do nothing. I am called to do something. So if I'm doing nothing, then I'm doing the wrong thing. It takes more energy to do nothing than it does to do something anyway. All right, four quick things on what it means to be called. Let's see what the verse says. Number one, God called me to follow Jesus Christ. Before I do something with somebody else, I have to commit myself to who it is I'm following. Look at what Paul says in that very second verse, first verse. Excuse me, not second verse, first verse. It says, Paul, say it with me. 
called to be an apostle of Christ, Jesus, by the will of God. Yeah. I've been called to be an apostle, a follower, a disciple of Christ Jesus by the will of God. You know, if God thought enough to call me, I don't have to check in with you and see if I'm qualified. What I need to do is make myself available. All right. The second one, God called me to grow up just like Jesus. It's not enough. It's not enough for me to just get regenerated and say, I'm going to follow Jesus Christ. That's what regeneration means. Salvation has three parts. The first part is regeneration. I make a decision that I'm going to follow Jesus Christ. But Jesus doesn't want me. God doesn't want me to just stay a little baby. He doesn't want me to just keep on eating McDonald's. Happy meal. I noticed that a lot of you did the illustration with that, and I'm glad that that had an impact on you. But the truth of the matter is, if you keep on eating baby food, you will not grow. The word for growth in the Bible is called sanctification. Let me hear you say that. Yes, sanctification means to grow up, to to be holy, to be pure, like God is holy, like God is pure. Again, there are many churches that say they're holiness churches or sanctified churches. Every church ought to be sanctified. Everybody ought to be holy people. It's not a one group of people that are holy. All of us ought to be growing. In verses 2 and 3, let's read it together. To the church of God in Corinth, to those sanctified in Christ Jesus and called to be his holy people. Are you called to be his holy people? Are you called to be his holy people? Are you called to be his holy people? If I am a follower of God, I am also called to grow. You know, your parents would be the saddest people in the world. They love you when you're little and you're small and you're cute when you're first born. Look at that little boy there. Look at that little girl there. Your big ears are sticking all out. And you look at how cute they are. But no parent wants to see their kid stay there. That little 10 years from now, they don't want to see you in the crib looking like this. <laughs> they don't want to see it. They want to see you doing something. As a matter of fact, if you didn't grow, there was a person who was like that, wasn't it? His name was Tom Thumb, I think it was, or something like that. And he never grew. That would be quite a tragedy because we are built to grow. And God has built us to grow spiritually. Called to be his holy people together with all those everywhere where who call on the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. Their Lord and ours. Grace and peace to you from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Number three. God spiritually gifted me to call people to Christ. I am gifted when I accept Jesus Christ and I start growing, my gifts begin to come out. And I have a responsibility of developing those gifts. Some of you made a decision a long time ago when you were growing up. I want to be a doctor. I want to be a lawyer. I want to be an engineer. Well, you didn't just go start being one. You went to school. You started hanging out. With people who wanted to be, you went to, if you went to a medical school, now you're hanging out with folk who want to be brain surgeons. Or if you wanted to be a spaceship driver, you went to NASA and you started hanging out with individuals who wanted to be spaceship drivers. You know, one of the things that is clear about church, church ought to be about people who want to be like God. I wouldn't belong to a church that didn't emphasize that, that we are trying to be God's holy people and we are calling people to him. Using our gifts, we are calling people to Christ. Come on, read it with me. I always thank my God for you because of his grace given you in Christ Jesus. For in him, you have been enriched in every way with all kinds of speech and with all knowledge. God thus confirming our testimony about Christ among you. Therefore, you do not lack any spiritual gift. Hey, look at the person next to you and say, you don't lack any gift. gift. 
get busy. Get busy. <laughs> As you eagerly wait for our Lord Jesus Christ to be revealed, he will also keep you firm to the end so that you will be blameless on the day of our Lord. Yeah. I don't have any excuse to not be trying to do something. And you know, for many of you who are young, you don't, again, you're not in competition. You ought to be volunteering. Will somebody in my church teach me how to preach? Will somebody in my church teach me how to teach? Will somebody in the church teach me how to, 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 to lead? You should be the one who is saying, you know what? Somebody should be discipling me. Somebody should be training me. Because that's what Jesus is. 99% of his ministry was not going around preaching. 99% of his ministry was with that small group of knuckleheads called the disciples. That's right. They were some knuckleheads. But guess what? When he left, would he say, all authority and power has been given to you. Now go. As a matter of fact, I got a feeling the picture's like this. Get out of here. I done taught you everything I can teach you. Now it's your turn now. No excuses. And many of them, Peter and John, went on to do great things. And courage came out of them that they didn't even know they had. The last one. Read it with me. God called me to unity about Christ, his word, and his church. A part of my responsibility is, yes, to go out. But a part of my responsibility is to also keep the unity within the church body. One of the things that saddens God is when churches fall apart. I don't know anything about your church. And so I don't, you know, I don't even know most of you where the church go. I've only been down to the Menlo Park Church. But I know that sometimes churches have conflict. Sort of like parents. Parents. In a family. Let me tell you, that doesn't make God happy. Somebody has to be the bigger person and say, we have a bigger responsibility than what you see as being important. Because when it comes down to the bottom line, it's not about what you see. It's not what about what I see. It's about what God sees. Let's get busy. And let's do what God says to do. Am I making sense to you? I have a responsibility. I cannot. If my church is going through a split or if my church is is being broken up, if Satan's gotten busy uh, in the church, and a lot of times it could just be egos. People sometimes are are big shots and and we're going to do it my way or or the highway. You know, I I know that. That sort of thing can happen. I I was talking about your church. No, I'm not talking about your church. Hey, I know. I've I've been there before. Here's the key right here. And even you as a young person, we've been called to bring unity. We've been called to work together. You can't do this by yourself. You cannot be effective in the work of God by yourself. So a part of my work is helping the body to stay together. Am I making sense to you? Just like in a family, a part of your work. That's why if your mother, your father say to you, you know, clean up your room. You know, look at that nasty room in there. You know, why don't you ever do something in here? uh, Cut the grass or or cook a meal. Why don't you ever do something? You know that at some point you should start doing something. Why? Because that helps the family. It takes the weight off of your mother. It takes the weight off of your father. And the same thing in the church. It takes the weight off of some people or a few people doing all of the work. The statistics say that 10%, 10% of the people in most churches do most of the work. We got to raise that percentage up. Here's what the Bible says. Let's read it together. God is faithful who has called you into fellowship with his son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. I appeal to you, brothers and sisters, in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that all of you agree with one another in what you say 
and that there be no division. Come on, say it with me now. No divisions among you, but that you be perfectly united in mind and thought. Hey, that's why he first gets into our head. Then he gets into our heart. And then he gets into our hands, what we do. He's called me to lead my community to Christ. We do that together. I said to you before, many people see our work like this. If you notice, all of these different ends, military, government, they're all going to church. That's not a good picture of the church. This is what the church ought to look like. The church ought to be going into the various areas of your community and making a difference. Am I making sense? Does this depiction make sense to you? The church ought to be going. As a matter of fact, if your community doesn't know you, and sometimes your community might be culturally different. Sometimes it may be racially different. It won't make any difference to Jesus Christ because his word and his love transcends all of that. They're the scoreboard. And if the people in your community don't know that you're in that community, then you're not doing your work. That's just another picture of what I've just shown you. Reggie McNeil, in his book, he says this. The church doesn't have a mission. The mission has a church. The mission belongs to God. Go ye into all the world, you know it, and make disciples, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything that I've taught you. And I'll be with you when you go. Number two, the church is not the point. You're not the point. The mission is the point. So when we get into a conflict, when we get mad at one another, we got to come back to the mission. Number three, we, the church, have been created to be boots on the ground partners. And one of the things that I love about the home of Christ church is that you are spread out all over the place, but you see yourself as one church working together. And I pray that you encourage your, one, one another to do the mission. This view of church means that every community where the church exists should be holistically better if the church has the mission right, spiritually, socially, economically. If I have got the mission right, then I, it should be a better place when I leave. The condition of the community is the scoreboard on how well the church is progressing being the people of God. We are transformers. That's what we do. What does that brand name mean? All right. Now you gave it What's that brand name? All right. What's that brand name? Uh, you know, people don't have any problem. Let me, let me tell you what. We, and we pay a lot of money uh, for, for, those, uh, for those brands, don't we? But look at this right here. I, I couldn't even find this on Google. But that's a U-Haul. And that's a what? That's a hearse. I've never seen anybody take Nike or Microsoft or even the clothes you're wearing out of this world. Am I making sense to you? So that means that in the end, that stuff means what? Nothing. The only depiction I know of that I can take out of this world. The cross has diminished. The culture doesn't see it as being as meaningful much anymore. But I got news for you. It is the only way to get right with God the Father. We have a window of opportunity. Romans 4, 17, God calls things that are not as though they were. You may not see yourself as being so much right now. But God has created you for a time like this. And he knows exactly how he wants to use you. I grew up in the Bronx, New York. It was considered to be the worst place in America back in 1950s, 1940s. Worst place in America. But God called me out of that place. And he has brought me to many other places. And I want you to know something. 
if God were to tell me to go back into that hell's kitchen, I wouldn't think one thing about it. I'd go. Now, I'd go kicking and screaming, but, <laughs> but I'd go. Why? Because my head is his. My heart belongs to him. My hands are under his authority. Ephesians 3.11 says that I have the responsibility of preparing God's people. Everybody has the responsibility of preparing God's people for works of service. That is more than just spiritual. I should be preparing you to go into the workplace, into the recreation place, and even going to buy you some new shoes. <laughs> I don't know where God's going to use you, but I do know this. God will use your hands wherever you allow him to do so. Acts 2, 37, our backdrop verse. Let's say it together. When the people heard this, they were cut to the heart. And said to Peter and the other apostles, brothers, what shall we do? Okay. That's all, folks. Let's give God a hand clap. That's all right. Let's give God a hand clap. I tell you, he, he's worth it. Ganey's not worth it. But he's worth it. I never asked, how did I do? Because that's not important. How did the Holy Spirit do? And that's why I give an invitation. I don't want you to come up here to impress me or to make me feel good. As a matter of fact, at this point in my, my career, in my tenure, in my relationship with God, there's really nothing you can do. There's no praise that I need. What God needs is you. I'm going to ask you to stand on your feet. I'm going to ask our counselors to come. I'm going to ask our music ministers if they'll come. Here's what the invitation is. Here's the invitation. Hear me well now. If I don't have a clue about what that guy was talking about these last couple of times up here, I'm going to invite you to come and let us take you a little bit deeper. Let us, let us take, and I'll, I'll, I'll spend all evening with you here and, and talk with you about what we've been talking about in terms of making the Lord Jesus Christ the authority of your life. You see, you have to invite him in to do that. You, ha you have to be the one to say, you know, it's better when God leads, when he opens up the word for me and I become a doer of the word that's the first invitation the second invitation is for those who maybe kind of straddle the fence you know you you may go to a school where some of the guys and gals there are, are what we call the cool group or maybe you don't see christians as being cool but you see the other folks being cool they're doing things that we know are unethical or doing things that are immoral and, and we don't necessarily get involved in it but we don't speak to it we don't have the courage to we don't have the backbone to stand up and say that's wrong I'm not going to do that I'm not going to put that in my body I'm not going to allow you to use my body I'm not going to be involved with something that is going to cause me a lifetime of misery and pain just for a few moments pleasure you know if you're under that kind of pressure I want to invite you to come up tonight the last group that I want to invite now anybody can come but for those who just want to pray you know I don't know maybe you got something going on at home maybe it's your church that's going through some divisions and some challenges Maybe it's your household. Maybe your mother and father. You got a good image. You're putting on a good front. You got a good smile. But the fact of the matter is, I'm just dust and clay. And dust and clay falls apart. Can you pray with me about my family? 
Can you pray with me about my church? Can you pray that the word of God and God's mission becomes once again the most important thing in our lives?